Take your Bible, if you would, please. Let's start out again. Judges chapter 13, Ephesians chapter 6, if you would, turn to both of those places, and then I'll fill you in on the rest. Uh, as we move along, I need to get going with the message uh, so we can get going and, and uh, learning some things. I, I did it again. I added more to what I was preaching last Sunday. Now, the, the good part of that is, is that there's always something more to be learned from God's Word. Amen? Not from me. I'm not near smart enough to lead anybody to righteousness, to God's glory, to heaven. I'm not near smart enough to be anybody's mentor, anybody's teacher. It is in the Word of God alone that we get our knowledge, that we get our understanding, and that we get our wisdom. Those three things there are three of the seven spirits of God mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Three things you seek out in life. Three things that you are desirous of. By the way, before I forget it, I didn't mention this a while ago, congratulations to uh, Jerry and Sister Sandy back there. Jerry's got a brand new granddaughter. Yeah. What's her name? Say a May. I like that. How many pounds? Oh, my goodness. You couldn't get a better number than that. Amen. If you was rolling dice, you couldn't get a better number than that. Amen. Amen. Is she pretty? You want to keep her? All right, amen. It's his granddaughter, and we thank God for that. Amen, that's good. I like it when children are born. I like it when children are born in the kingdom. Amen. All right, let's get moving. Judges chapter 13, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. Now, again, this is a teaching on why... Why does it seem like, even though I'm saved, even though I'm born again, why does it feel like at times that there's just something that has, seems like it has power over me? It seems like I just can't, I can't, I can't shake it, I can't get rid of it. I've been through this. I grew up in this church thinking that all these, these adult saints here, uh, Lynn, your mom and daddy was, was part of that. Used to think those those men and those women were so godly, that they were so uh, great people, that they never did anything wrong, that they never sinned. They were some of them were my Sunday school teachers. Some of them were, I mean, the preachers that I sat under here. I mean, I just thought the world of them. I got to be a teenager. I got to be a young adult, and I started looking for that day that apparently shows up in an adult when you are what I thought those people were. Sinless, didn't have no problems, didn't have, uh, didn't have any weaknesses or anything like that. That day never came. And through the process of time and reading the scriptures and, and hearing hearing some messages from some other good men that God has put in my life, I learned some things. That as long as I'm in this body, number one, it's always going to try to kill me. Number two, it is always going to be disobedient to God, and there's no changing that. This body is weak. It is powerless. I mean, we read in Sunday school that an angel, the, the sixth trumpet's going to sound, and that angel is going to release four angels on this earth, and they're going to have the power to kill a third of the people on this, on this earth. Now, that's power. And no human can stop that. You can't stop sometimes how you think. You can't stop sometimes what you're thinking, or where your thoughts lead, or... Saying things that you shouldn't say, uh, dirty things, evil things, things about other people, uh, living a lifestyle that 
You know it was wrong, but you have no power against it whatsoever. That was one of the things God said to the Israelites. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to fix it to where you will have no power to stand against your enemies. So now we're going to learn how to deal with this in this life. This life that we live, unless God saves you the day that you die, and I've seen that before, but unless God kills you the same day you get saved, there are battles that you're going to fight. There are battles that you're going to fight for your children and your grandchildren, and are they worth fighting for? Amen. And I'm not talking, well, see again, we're not fighting flesh and blood. We're talking about devils. I'm looking at all my grandchildren sitting here in this church house this morning, thinking of all my children and their families, and thinking of the world that they're growing up in. There are sodomites everywhere. There are perverts everywhere. There's a network of them working all over the country, all over the world. Did you hear about that new movie come out with Jim Caviezel? Boy, it is stirring up some hatred. Because this movie is exposing that there is a pipeline, a network of pedophiles, sodomites, that are actively stealing children and using them and then killing them and drinking their blood. And if you don't believe that, I can show it to you in the Bible. I'm telling you, this stuff is real. Are our children worth fighting for? Our grandchildren, our families, the idea of a family and what a family is. Is, our, is your church worth fighting for? Is it worth standing up for? Is it worth living for? Your faith. Somebody said a faith not worth dying for is not worth living for. Well, if you believe this faith and you hold on to it, it's worth dying for. It's worth fighting for it until you die. Amen. Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. And so I'm just telling you, there's fights that are going to have to be had and fights that need to be won. My, our country, we love our country. Amen. I'm glad. Listen, they sent me that Bible that said, we the people. And every time I see that in the back of somebody's truck, back of somebody's car, it always makes me think of the brilliance of how to start out what was the constitution of this nation. It's not I the king. It's not I the president or we the Congress. It says we the people. Of the United States and is that not worth fighting for okay but it'll never be won in an election it'll only be won on our knees amen for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against wickedness in high places. Now, I'm going to go past the principalities. We did all that. We learned all about the number four, four hundred, four thousand. We got into powers last Sunday morning. Uh, this verse basically says, talks about the Lord and the power that he has. And in thy hand is power and might. And in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. So we're learning about what power is. And we finished off last Sunday morning with an illustration. I, I found this on the Internet. And I made the illustration of how, how did Hitler take over Poland? How did Hitler take over Czechoslovakia? How did Hitler invade basically most? How did Hitler take over France? How, how would he have taken over Great Britain? Great Britain held out. God bless them. But how would he have done that? He would have done it with an army because everybody outside of Germany hated Adolf Hitler. They knew, they knew what kind of man he was. They did not want some, I don't, listen, I don't want some foreign king ruling over this country, amen? But how would it happen? Their army's bigger than our army. Their army has got more power than our army has. And I will say this, you know, the first president I ever got to vote on was Ronald Reagan in 1984. And what he said made sense to me that the only way that you're going to stop the Soviet Union is to build more than what they've got and, and tell them, we've got more than you've got. We're more powerful than you are. Don't try it with us. And it worked. It worked. If, uh, if you were carrying a million dollars around in the trunk of your car and it was everything you had in life and you were wanting to protect it, I guarantee you, you'd take some of that million dollars and hired some guys with some guns to sit in your car and just wait for somebody to touch your car. Amen? That's power. That's what it is. Now, 
Ecclesiastes chapter 8, where the word of a king is, there's power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? But the king can only reign if he's got the power to do it with. Now, I mentioned that we started out with principalities. And I said, think of that as a print. Pri think of one of, what was one of the names that Isaiah gave to Jesus back before he was ever born. Wonderful. Counselor. The mighty God. The everlasting father. What was the fifth one? The prince. So it, and the prince of what? Would you rather have a king of war and strife living in your heart or a prince that brought peace? A king that brings peace. So we have the prince of peace. And then we have the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. One of those is going to be the king in your life. And I said, so picture the principalities as the kings. Picture the powers as his army. It is what gives him power. And I'm going to illustrate that with the Bible. Let's stop and pray before I move on. Father, I just ask that you bless this message. God, that you would open up our eyes, my eyes, to greater things than what we know. Or Lord, open up our eyes once again. Put us in remembrance of things that we once learned. Bless your word this morning. Give us understanding. Give us knowledge. And then, Father, give us wisdom, Lord, to live this life you've caused us to live. And, Father, everybody that we know that's lost, Father, one day they're going to turn against us. Even people in our own family. Forcing, forcing even their Christian family members to go along with their evil lifestyle. Or accuse them of being hate mongers. Accuse them of being all kinds of evil things that they're not. Just because we don't go along with the way some people live. So Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help us to stand in this dark day. And having done all, to withstand in the evil day when it comes. So just bless your word, Father. Give us power, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said. Turn your Bible to Revelation 12. And I want you to see this in there. To illustrate what it is that I was referring to. When, the, when Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, he meant it. And let's say that you've got somebody that is just a thorn in your side. They are, they are, uh, they are everything you are not. Uh, well, in fact, I'll tell you a true story. I have a family that uh, we've known over the years. They follow our ministry. They go to a, uh, a Bible-believing church out in Pennsylvania. They own a family business. They raised three children. They homeschooled them and taught them well, taught them, taught them good. I've known them for years. Good people, too. And mom and dad really loved the Lord. The problem is that this man's wife's mother is both a lesbian and a witch, practicing witch. And she has been working. She's hated her own daughter and hated her son-in-law for being born again, for being a Christian, for believing in the Bible. And she has always worked against that family. Uh, she's tried to have their business shut down. She's done all kinds of evil things to them. Then she decided she would start going after their children. Now their children are, I think the youngest one now is uh, over 18. But it all started several years ago. The oldest one, a boy, went off to, listen to this, he went off to Bible college. He went off to Bible college. And someone in Bible college uh, opened up his eyes to what he thought was the truth. And that is, there, is, there are multiple gods. Jehovah is one of those gods, uh, but so is Thor, and so is Jupiter, and all these, all these ancient gods and myths. Uh, somebody in his Bible college, another student, uh, taught him that, and now he believes that. And of course, he's taking drugs. The middle daughter seemed to be uh, just kind of okay, but it was they brought their youngest daughter to me. And they said... We can't do anything with her. And they, they told me what happened was that was that their, his mother-in-law, his wife's mother, 
sent in three teenage girls, one at a time, to try to draw this 17-year-old daughter of theirs into lesbianism. Deliberately. When the first three didn't work, she kept trying. She finally found one that she sent in there. And for some reason, this one clicked with their daughter. And yep, got her in bed with her. Of course, the oldest son now is siding with the daughter. And he's introduced her to drugs. I mean, this is the world that we live in, right? So they know they can't fight, they can't kill the grandma. That's against the law nowadays. Can't kill your mother-in-law, amen. Amen. But you can sure stand up against some devils. So what happens is there is a spirit. It's not the mother-in-law. It's not the grandma. There are spirits that are with her that are causing their children to fall away. And in this world now, it's easier done, isn't it? Seems like we're surrounded on every side. So let me illustrate for you this, de this deal of we have a prince and then we have his army. In Revelation 12, verse 7, there was a war in heaven. Michael, who the book of Daniel calls a prince. He is a principality angel on God's side. His name means like, who is like unto God. That's what his name means. Michael and his who? His what? His angels. What are his angels? They are his army. His fighting force. And I absolutely 100% believe that every child of the living God, every saint, every, every human is has guardian angels dispatched to them to go with them in the way to how many of you ever just had your life saved one day and you were sure to die listen i guarantee you god sent angels down there to protect your life amen there is a big old angel that pushed me off of that electrical connection that I was hooked on to and saved my life. I believe it with all my heart. The dragon, now the, his angels fought against the dragon. Who's the dragon? It's Satan. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He is a prince. And the prince has, he, the, his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels you see the army there this there's two princes and there's two armies fighting prevailed not meaning the dragon hey shout say amen get happy or just say amen however you want to do it that we already know that god's angels will prevail in the war somebody say amen Prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. In fact, they, they run them flat out of heaven. Say, get out and don't come back. Amen. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So I believe God eventually does give Victory, don't you? Somebody say amen. Let me give you another illustration. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. I like this story. I like this story. Second Kings chapter 6. This is where Elisha had his... Um, had his servant with him, Gehazi, I think is what his name was. And if you remember, Gehazi went to him all crying and everything. Oh, we're surrounded. Oh, they're going to kill us all. Listen, despair is real. 
Hopelessness is real. Having hopelessness, having despair, being in fear is real. That in itself is a monster to try to fight. And it's one of those that you cannot fight with Anthony Robbins, feel-good tapes, motivational speakers, or motivational books. You cannot fight them that way. The only way to fight them is with a shield of faith, a helmet of salvation, sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and those other things that He tells us to fight them with. That's the only way we, that's the only way we have any victory. So, 2 Kings chapter 16, here's another illustration of it. Verse 13, he said, Go and spy where he is, that they may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. In other words, they're looking for Elisha. Therefore sent he hither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. They got the whole city circled. We're, and this is us now. We're surrounded by them. They're not letting us go anywhere. They're not letting us move. They're not letting us do anything. I, I wonder... I wonder, in all those months, we think it, I think it goes back to February. All of those days and months that somebody was taking and stealing from this church, from our mailbox, how many people died because we couldn't feed them? You see, I, I believe the spiritual realm is easier to understand for me than the human realm. I don't understand humans. And, and, and if whoever is doing this, apparently they are smart enough to get a good job. But for some reason, they just don't want to work it. So I don't understand people sometimes, but I, I'm, I'm starting to understand spirits. And uh, they dispatch some spirits against this church to try to disarm us, to try to stop what we're doing, starve some people, give us a bad name, whatever it was. So anyway, in verse 15, when the servant, the man of God was risen early and gone, when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, and host compassed the city, and uh, both with horses and chariots, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, uh, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now, we just read back in, in Revelation, and we didn't uh, get the number here, but earlier in Revelation chapter 12, we, yeah, we, we, we find that the dragon had a third of the angels with him. Now, correct my math. Okay, Dave, correct my math. Two-thirds, in my mind, is bigger than one-third. Am I right on that? So I'd rather have two-thirds of that coconut cream pie, Jim, you said your wife could make. That was good for diabetics. I'd rather have two-thirds of that pie than one-third of it. Am I right in that? Absolutely, I'm right on that. There are more that are with us already than there are that are against us. And it will always be that way. Amen. So back to this. Now, he, his, his servant, said, I don't believe that. I, but you know why? He was walking by sight and not by faith. We're looking, we're looking at the condition of this country. We're looking at the the bumbling man with dementia running our country and there's no doubt in my mind now that this man is suffering i think it's sad he's suffering with dementia they are covering it up but stories get leaked out every now and then even cnn has to every now and then say something about it and they say this guy he's awful he embarrassed the whole country with the King of England, King Charles. King Charles said, come along with me. And Joe did this. And then he turned around and was staring at this guard, just going. 
And finally, King Charles had to take him and say, come on, you'll go with me now, come on. Like a nurse in a nursing home. We're looking at that. We're looking at the next election like that's going to save us. It's not. Let's get our priorities straight. Only God saves. Now, so uh, verse 16. And he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. And what that tells you, they're angels. Angels are made of fire. The Bible says he made his uh, angels, his servants, a flaming fire. The, the horses and chariots of fire, just like what came and picked up Elijah. That's how Elisha recognized him. When Elisha saw the horses and chariots of fire, he's going, Ah, oh, I know what you guys are. He knew it. He had seen it before. He saw it take up Elijah into heaven. Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And the young man he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord. In other words, when the army came down against him, the evil army came down against him. Now watch this. Sometimes God will not act until the attack starts. Sometimes he won't. But even in that, God is just showing you how powerful he is against your enemies. And when he came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And God did a wondrous work. So we have this mountain full of angels surrounding Eli or Elisha. And um, what did I say his servant's name was? Gehazi. Surrounding both of them because they're the target. They're going to get killed by this massive human army. And God's angels saves Elisha on that day. We are always going to be fighting a spiritual battle. Which means, now we've got somebody standing out in the foyer right now. We have somebody out there usually every service. That is not only guarding and protecting and watching our parking lot, but they're watching to make sure nobody comes in here while we're sitting here trying to listen to the Word of God and have church with evil intentions in mind. And this is how it has to be now in the world that we live in. But I can tell you that there's something a whole lot more powerful than that man standing out in the foyer there with his pistol. We've got angels surrounding us all the time. Somebody say amen. Now, powers are... Here, listen to this. One. Here's one of the enemies that you're fighting. Psalm 49, 15. God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Does the grave have power? Everybody in this world, everybody you know, everybody that's ever lived is living now or will live until the Lord puts an end to it all. They will go to the grave. But if you are misunderstanding God or the Bible and believe that the grave is it, that's the end of it, there's nothing left for you, no matter what kind of life you live, you're just going to end up turning back into dirt again and you don't have anything to worry about after that. If that's what you think, you are wrong. Because the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. God is going to take everybody you know. Moms and dads, God is going to take every one of your children, and they're going to die. And then He's going to take them, and He's going to judge them. If I were to ask moms and dads to stand up in this church in testimony of they don't want their children to go to hell, hopefully we'd have parents all over this auditorium standing up. I don't want my children going to hell. But one thing I know about them, 
is that they fight the same battles that mommy and daddy fought. They fight, they fight some of the same battles that they don't know mommy and daddy ever fought. They fight them. And their children are going to fight them one of these days. Maybe some of them are fighting them right now. And we don't want our family members, I don't want my wife going to hell, I don't want my children going to hell, I don't want, and I'll be honest with you, there are some people in this world that I am not happy with right now. Some of you know why. I would have to be some, some kind of absolute reprobate to pray that God burns them in the lake of fire forever. The best thing that I could do for my enemies is to pray that God changes them. You say, oh, I don't know, Pastor. Well, God changed you, didn't he? Or did he? Did he? So the grave is one of the powers that are against us. We're dying as we're living right now. Our body is fighting off death with every breath we take, everything that we eat, every day that we live. God built in us white blood cells and other things to help fight off disease, to help fight off other things. But eventually, all of those things run out. There is no medicine. There is no... Uh, uh, there's, there's nothing in this world that you can chew up, swallow, mix with water or anything that will stop you from dying. It's going to happen. And yet this world right now is trying to fight off with science and technology the power of the grave. They don't understand that the power of the grave is not really in the hands of man. Who does the Bible right now say has the power of death? Well, God does, but who did He give it to in this earth? Satan has the power of death. And if God doesn't hold him back, he'll kill. We learned in Sunday school, four angels coming out of the river Euphrates kill a third of the people on the earth. They have power to kill. Brian and Pam gave testimony about how Noah is doing better. And she told me, she said, I know they gave him medicines and all this treatment that works a whole lot better than anything ever has against childhood leukemia. But she said, I know it was God that healed him. Because if, the, if God lets spirits, devils attack your child and take their life, all the medicine in the world won't save them. And I want to tell you something, dealing with the power of the grave when it's somebody that you are desperately in love with. See, the grave reaches far beyond the person that dies, doesn't it? Ecclesiastes 4.1, So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. I want you to notice something in this word, oppressions. It's something I've... I've uh, brought out before and it's this word press oh I got the wrong color ink I'm trying to draw on a black background with black ink let me see if I can change it ah oh, there we go how about some yellow ink that might be better this word right here called press and oppression is something that bears down on your soul, bears down on your flesh. It becomes then a weight that you can't carry for very long. Us guys, you know, we get wherever we work or wherever we hang out with each other and try to show how strong we are. Look, I can hold this up. Look how long I can hold this up. Yeah, but you can hold it up maybe for a minute, but you can't carry it around all day. Not even Jesus Christ could carry the cross all the way to Calvary. He had to have some help. He was bearing our burdens, pressed down. So Solomon said, I almost named him Ecclesiastes. 
Solomon said, consider all the oppressions that are done under the sun and behold the tears of such as were oppressed. And they had no comforter. Think of all the people that you know that are not, have not, and will never learn what you have learned or are learning now from the scriptures about where oppression really comes from. It doesn't just come from situations that happen in life that are bad, because some days we can handle them pretty well, some days we can't. It comes from spirits who are oppressing spirits. And their intent is to weigh us down. Why is it that Paul told us to lay aside uh, the weight of sin and everything, I can't remember the verse, but everything that would hold us back? There's some, what was that, Alicia? Now she lost it. Let us set aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. We come to a door and we go, boy, that door looks locked. It probably, we probably can't even enter in. And we get so easily beset by some of the simplest things that we won't even try sometimes. Maybe it's because you've been oppressed too long. I don't know. But he says, behold, the tears of such as were oppressed and they had no comfort. Or think about all the people that you know that will never know what you know now or what you've learned or what you will learn. And they've had to deal with something all their life and they had no savior in their life, either by their own choice or whatever. They just had no savior. They didn't want a savior or they didn't think religion was the answer. They tried drugs. They tried alcohol. They tried yoga. They tried self-help. They're, now they're trying marijuana all over the state. Marijuana's not the answer either. When will people figure it out? They have no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors, there was power. The spirits that were pressing them down and oppressing them, and laying weights and burdens on them, they were spirits and they've got power. Brother, I'm here to tell you, they've got power. But the people who are under that power, they have no comforter, which means they have the Holy Spirit cannot help them, won't help them because they won't ask. You say, is that biblical? You have not because you ask not. And sometimes it's as simple as saying, God, help. God, help. Do a study of the book of Psalms. I know there's 150 of them, but it'll be worth your while. You know what you'll find in there? You'll not find David offering good advice to people on how to overcome this and how to overcome that. You'll find David saying, I cried unto the Lord. I cried. Maybe your problem is you haven't, you haven't shed any tears for your problem. Maybe you haven't shed enough or maybe you haven't shed any for your problem. Maybe it'd be good for you to, even if you want to get alone somewhere, you know, I don't say, think you have to do it in front of everybody, but get alone somewhere and just get alone and cry. And say, God, help. I don't even know what to ask for. God, help. I spent the last, what's it been since February? February, March, April, May, June. Now we're into July, last four and a half months. Asking God what was going on. I had no, I had no direction to pray in. I had no idea what was happening. And yet, lo and behold, God blessed better than I asked. See how simple that is? That's when you have a shield of faith. That's when you have a helmet of salvation. That's when you have your loins girt about with truth, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and the sword of the spirit. That's when that happens. Here's Satan's power over people. Ephesians 2. Turn there. I've mentioned this verse and I've mentioned his name, but I'd like for you to underline it in your Bible. You underline it and when you go back through your Bible one day, you'll, you'll see that. Make a note on it if you want to. We used to have an old saint in here, Sister Hazel Waymeyer. Man, I miss her. I didn't know this, but uh, I, I was preaching out of a certain text one day. And I said, I don't know if I've ever preached out of this text 
since I've been pastor here. And she raised her hand. I said, yes, Sister Hazel. She said, yeah, you did. It was on uh, April 4th, and it was uh, in uh, 1998. I said, do you do that with everything I preach? She said, yeah, I write it down when you preach it. So, <laughs> maybe that's the reason why I just don't like to go back over scriptures, but I end up doing it anyway. Ephesians 2, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's where we were like Lazarus. We were Lazarus laying in the grave and our sins made, our sins made us stink. And your sins do stink. They stink to heaven. They are a stench in the nostrils of God. God hates your sins. Don't you ever forget that, that God hates your sins. Do not think that you're getting away with it and getting away with sin. And God is okay with it because He's not. They, you are stinking dead before God, and yet God resurrected you. Where and in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now, s some people make different things out of this phrase, the prince of the power of the air. They say, well, he's got power over storms. Well, maybe he does. He's got power over whirlwinds and tornadoes. Well, maybe he does. He's got, you know, power over, uh, you know, just the airwaves. People say that. Now, well, maybe he does. I'm sure he does. But he follows it up with the prince of the power of the air, the spirit. Did you know the word spirit means breath, air? So he's talking about the chief prince of all devils, all of hell's angels, all of those one-third of angels that he's going to get kicked out of heaven with or already is kicked out, he's talking about those. He, they work for him. They do what he tells them to do. And they are just, the devil cannot be everywhere all at once. So he dispatches his angels out to you. And I guarantee you, there, are, there is about, a, I, I wouldn't give a number. I, let's just say there's 100,000 devils around you every day and they all know everything there is to know about you. They know how to attack you. They know where your weak spots are. They know what your sin is. You're not hiding it from them. They know it. They talked you into it. They, in fact, they were the ones who first introduced it to you when probably you were 8, 9, 10 years old. Or maybe even younger than that. Now... Let me, let me give you a list here of what this power how, or how it's manifested in our lives. This you might want to take some time to write it down. It's not uh, an overall list. I, I, I couldn't think of every single thing that people get into. But these are, let's just say that for every sin, every issue in our life, there's devils that are there to bring them on. First thing we deal with is lust. And don't tell me you don't. Because you do. Whether you're a woman and you are looking at a man that is not your husband, or you're a man looking at a woman that is not your wife, and that's only one, that's only one type of lust. What was the 10th commandment? The first, what he started out with first is thou shall not covet thy neighbor's house. He mentioned house before he mentioned anything else. And, and I can tell you that there are some people in Kenya that live in places that you wouldn't even call a shed and they're quite happy they're quite happy they don't have running water don't even get me started on toilets in Kenya they're just a hole in the ground but they're quite happy and here in this country somebody builds a new house some people got to build something newer. Somebody builds a nice looking house. Somebody's got to either build that one or build something that's better looking than that one. 
And there's a huge race on. We, we, we tend and we have, we've done this for years in this country. Marveled at our architecture, marveled at our houses, marveled at the, the places that people live and dwell in. And all of that is evil, wicked covetousness. The Apostle Paul said, having food and raiment, teach us to wherewith be, to be content. If you've got clothes to wear, food to eat, water to drink, be happy, amen. You don't have to lust out of what, of what everybody else has. You know, what's, you know what's driving political power in this country? There are people who are, who are stirring up poor people against rich people. And they're going to demand that the rich people give up their wealth and distribute it to all the poor people. You know what that's called? Plain old Bolshevik. You, you thought I was going to say something different, did you? <laughs> Plain old Karl Marx Bolshevik communism. It's exactly, and it's godless is what it is. But that's what, that's what L Joseph Lenin, that's how he won the revolution in Russia, was he stirred up the covetousness of the poor against the rich. And the same thing's happening in our country right now. We're going to lose this country. Addictions. Addictions. Addictions to drugs, now that marijuana is legal. And the whole thing about that was, there's two things about it. Number one, there were spirits that were working to get that passed. Understand that. That spirits wanted the state of Missouri to be high and happy all the time. Number two, it was about taxation. They knew that there was a multi-million dollar industry going on in the state of Missouri that Jefferson City wasn't getting their, their piece of the pie. And so it's about taxation. But addictions, addictions to drugs, whether they are legal drugs or whether they are illegal drugs. But drugs is absolutely destroying our country. Addictions that are related to fornication in no matter what way. A man stepping out on his wife, a wife stepping out on her husband, men and women who refuse biblical marriage, refuse legal marriage, and just shack up with each other and say that God's okay with it. Well, he's not. It's just pure lust and fornication. That's what it is. And it ain't nothing more than that. But then it turns into worse. Then it started turning into sodomy. From both genders. And Paul predicted this in Romans chapter 1. He said, it's going to happen. Sodomy on both sides. And now we have a... Huge pedophilia problem in this country. It is widespread. It is in every community. It's in churches. It's in uh, city halls, mayor's offices, the legislature, governor's mansions. It exists everywhere it is a terrible evil wicked lust that Jesus said whoever harms a child be better for them that they hang a millstone around their neck and cast themselves into the sea than it will be for them in the day of judgment Hugh Hefner turned this nation almost single-handedly into an adulterous nation. Almost by himself. 
But he wouldn't have been able to do it had the lust not been there to begin with. Alcohol, addictions to alcohol, fornication, pornography, etc. It is everywhere now. And parents, your kids' tablets and phones are the number one target. I showed Alicia this uh, the other day, a man, and I'm almost done, I'll quit in a minute. I'll go over this next Sunday. A man that was being interviewed, young man, and he brought his laptop with him and the guy said, show me how easy it is to get uh, a, a pedophile predator after you. So this young man signed in, he, he, just, he just found out where all the teenagers in a particular area, whatever city it was, and he logged on with an account, put a picture of himself like he was a 13-year-old girl, put it in his profile that he was 13, that he was female, put his, his, his uh, sign-on name as like Abigail 13 Jersey or something like that, so it would really identify this person as a 13-year-old girl from this particular area. And he said, now watch this. He said, so far I haven't said anything in this chat group. And in front of the camera, he typed in, as this, posing as this girl, Hi, anybody want to chat? In less than 10 seconds, a 47-year-old man wrote back and said, I do. Do you want to fool around? Ten seconds. Ten seconds. That's all it takes. And I, I listen. The technology we have, boy, it's a wonderful thing. But you've got a serpent in your house. You do. And once that addiction gets started, you ask anybody that has any kind of addiction, whether it's drugs, alcohol, anything, they'll tell you, I was just a kid. And once it gets started, I, I listen, I won't say it never goes away because I know what God can do with people. I've seen him work. I've seen God do absolutely what I've seen God give people victory is what I've seen. Amen. But that's just part of the power that these devils bring. And they'll press it. They'll push it. Just like a drug dealer. He'll push it. He'll press it. He'll, he'll, he'll run after you with it. He'll chase you down the street until he can catch you or until God stops him. Now, moms and dads, Moms, dads, parents, grandparents. Isn't that worth fighting for? Isn't that worth fighting some devils over? Isn't that worth asking God to open your eyes to see that there is hope? That there are angels around? That God is there to help us? It's worth it. I'm telling you, it's worth it. So I want us to bow our heads this morning. And I'm, I'm just going to have a, I'm going to call it the pew is your altar unless you want the altar. Okay? We're not here to expose anybody. We're not here to, not here to embarrass anybody. Some people who get addicted to things, they just don't want everybody knowing about it, even if they've got victory over it. But we'll just say that the pew right now is your altar. And at some point, you keep fighting long enough, God will give you some victory. Ask him this morning. Ask him. Father, we come before you today.
And Lord, things like this are hard to preach. It's because they reach so deep into every one of us. They stick like clay to us. Stick like tar. And Lord, we know, God, that the sin is real. We know that you hate it. But we have no power to stand against any of our enemies. You did not make our bodies strong when it came up to standing against or standing for the Ten Commandments. Adam couldn't even turn down the one sin that was available on the earth. He couldn't even turn down that one. And we're all sons of Adam. You made us all out of dirt, so there's no expectation that our flesh is ever going to please you, honor you. That's why you told us to worship you in the spirit. The flesh profiteth nothing. But Father, there's some people listening to my voice right now, here, there, anywhere, that cries out to you. To be delivered, to be healed, to be forgiven, and the sins to be forgotten. They cry out to you today for the past to be stuck in the past and to be given a new way to walk, a new way to live being made free and father the tools are there right there in the scriptures to pray to trust you to be saved to be truthful and honest about who we are and what we do and then be willing to share it with others and to never neglect the sword father the tools are there and they're not carnal, they're all spiritual. Father, we pray, dear God, that you would give somebody victory today over some sins, whatever they are, wherever they are. We're asking for victory today. Bless your word this morning. Bless these people. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Stand to your feet. And when you do, you are dismissed. You cannot leave if you don't stand up.